There are moments when it feels like time stands still. But when those moments turn into days, months, years, we start to wonder if life will ever begin again. It is written that there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the sun. Now is the time. <laughs> I didn't hear that, but apparently it was funny. So, <laughs> In keeping with our bad dad joke intro, I have one and only one to contribute that is in keeping with our teaching for today. So why is Dwayne The Rock Johnson always so sad? Because everyone takes him for granted. Okay, I promise that that will make sense in just a few moments. So I want to welcome everybody in the room and those of you that are joining us online. We've heard about an exponential number of people being sick. And so we want you to know if you're at home today for that reason, we are praying for you. So also glad that you have joined us here on this Father's Day weekend. My dad is watching from Manitoba. So I want to say happy Father's Day to my dad. And as well, my kids are here from Bothell. So that makes today even more special. And I'm glad to be able to share it with you. So we've been walking through Ecclesiastes chapter 3 this summer and we're about to reach the midway point of 14 phrases that Solomon uses to describe the life and the seasons of life. Every one of these phrases is relevant to you because if you're not in it right now, you have been. And if you haven't been, you're going to be at some point. That's why the Bible says this. There's a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. And here's the wisdom for this week, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to search and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. Solomon concludes and says, what do workers gain from their toil? I've seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He's made everything beautiful in its time. He's also said eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. So this week, we are at the beginning of verse number five, where we hear these words, there is a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. Now, unless you're a rock collector, that line is a little confusing, right? Solomon says there's a time to scatter some rocks. He, and you'll notice he doesn't say throw them. And a time to put some in a pile. Like, what in the world does that mean? Well, I'm not a rock collector, but I do have a number of stones that I like to hold on to because they're important to me. This rock comes from the beach where Jesus restored Peter with the words, Peter, do you love me? Three times he asked. This particular rock right here is from the creek in the valley where David went to collect five smooth stones before he went out to face Goliath. I like to hold on to that one. And this one actually came from the rock path that you walk on as you're heading towards the garden tomb in Jerusalem. I hold on to them because they are meaningful to me. And I started checking the Bible. And if you haven't noticed, rocks and stones are everywhere. In no particular order, there are ten commandments that are chiseled into rock. The standards of God are written into stone. David goes out to face Goliath, and before he does, he goes to a creek, and he selects five small weapons, five smooth stones. The Israelite cross the Jordan River, and they gather stones to make a memorial. Solomon builds a temple foundation out of rock and stone. Today, there is a single rock underneath of the western wall in Jerusalem that weighs over 300 tons. They have no idea how they got it there, and it is laid with such precision, you cannot even slip a piece of paper between that stone and the rocks that are surrounding it. It's a modern building marvel. Jesus told us to build our faith on a rock. That's why we sing, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Jesus comes, he lives, he dies, and he's placed in a tomb behind a stone. But when the dead doesn't stay dead, the stone is rolled away and Jesus wins for all of us. And that's worth celebrating on this Father's Day. And then at the end of the book, the Bible speaks of a white stone with your name engraved on it that is given to you as a symbol of your acquittal and your invitation into the family of God. Rocks and stones are used throughout Scripture 
But what does Solomon mean when he says there's a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them? Well, sometimes when the Bible is confusing, it's best to start at the end and work your way backwards towards the truth. So let's start at the end where Solomon says this. He says there's a time to gather stones. So stones, like the one under the west wall in Jerusalem, they were gathered in the process of building. 1 Kings chapter 5 says, At the king's command, they removed from the quarry large blocks of high-grade stone to provide a foundation of dressed stone for the temple. So building required the gathering of stones because that was the primary building material of the time. And I'm very glad that in the ancient times they used stones instead of wood and drywall because the stones are still there. In Israel, you can literally walk back through history by observing the layers of stone upon stone, culture upon culture, age upon age, dynasty upon dynasty. You can literally follow history back as you trace the stones further and further down into the ground. Every culture and every person represented by those stones had an opportunity to choose God. Some did, many did not. That's why God said, choose you this day, whom you will serve. It also says this, for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. When you build your life and your family, always remember that God also said this, unless the Lord builds the house, you labor in vain those that build it. So building wisely on the firm foundation of Jesus is good truth for everybody, especially on Father's Day. So they gathered stones to build. This next gathering of stones is difficult because of the tragedy that goes along with it. But in the Old Testament, stones were gathered to exact punishment. Joshua 7 is a troubling passage of Scripture. In Joshua chapter 6, Israel had just experienced an incredible victory over Jericho, right? The walls came crashing down through music and shouting. It's an incredible story. God had told his people, after you conquer Jericho, I want you to leave everything inside of the town. It needs to be burnt. But unfortunately, one man decided to disregard God's orders, a man by the name of Achan. He stole some of the valuables, hid them in the ground of his tent. Joshua chapter 7, the Israelites go out to take on another city, a little town, incidental town named Ai. They should have won easily because of the victory in Jericho. They lose they lose. You know why? Because sin never goes unnoticed by a holy God. Achan and his family are confronted with their disobedience, and even though it's probably going to make you uncomfortable, this is what happens in Joshua 7. Joshua said to Achan, why have you brought this trouble on us? The Lord will bring trouble on you today. And all of Israel stoned him, and after they had stoned the rest, they burned them. And over Achan, they heaped up a large pile of rocks, which remains to this day. Then the Lord turned from his fierce anger. Therefore, that place has been called the Valley of Achor. Achor means trouble, and it's been called that ever since. What's the lesson there? God takes sin seriously, and so should we, especially our own. I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but it's really, really easy to point out the sin of somebody else, right? Isn't that simple? I could point out your stuff, And your baggage and your garbage, I can do it just like this, but when the fingers are pointed back, God keeps whispering, before you point your finger at anybody else, you better examine what's hidden underneath of the floor of your own tent. Now, before you react to the severity of the story, I want to remind you of something important. Your sin and mine, which should have been rightly punished, was forgiven by the same God who gave his son Jesus as a sacrifice to cover all of that, which brings us to another reason why in the Old Testament they would gather stones. It was to actually sacrifice. So in the Old Testament, God required a sacrifice to cover sin. And the sin was offered on an altar of stones, and there were instructions that went along with those altars. Deuteronomy 27 says, Build there an altar to the Lord your God, an altar of stones. Do not use any iron tool on them. Build the altar of the Lord your God with field stones and offer burnt offerings on it to the Lord your God. Your God. So before a sacrifice could be offered to cover sin, an altar had to be built. Here's the beautiful part for all of us. Jesus came and offered his life to cover our sin so that there would never, ever, ever again have to have a sacrifice that was made. Hebrews chapter 9 says this, Jesus did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once and for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption 
for us. For us. So stones were gathered to build, to punish, to sacrifice, and there's one more reason. Stones were gathered to remember. So when the people of Israel crossed over the Jordan River into the promised land, this is what God tells them to do. Joshua chapter 4. It says, when the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, choose 12 men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priests are standing, and carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together the 12 men he'd appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites to serve as a sign among you. And in the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. So the people were supposed to pick up these stones and make a pile on the other side of the Jordan to remind them that in spite of their 40-year journey that was filled with all kinds of obstacles, it was to remind them of one fact. God kept his promise. God showed up and he kept his promise. And that's the right kind of memorial that each of us should make whenever we have one of those breakthrough moments. We should erect a memorial to honor God, to set up a marker that says God is worthy to be praised, to put up a memorial that says God got me through. That's the right kind of memorial, but here's where so many of us get stuck. Instead of remembering God's help and God's triumph and God's deliverance, We focus on the wrong kind of memorial and we build something to remind us of our own failure. We curate a memory of a moment when we fell so short and we've allowed that pile of stones, those old memories, to define us. And here's what we do. We fixate on it. Have you ever noticed that? Like if I ask you a question, can you tell me a moment when you just didn't get it right, you have a memory that's there like that. We fixate on a personal failure. We hold on to it in the dark corners of our memory. We obsess over it, even though God told us it's been covered by his sacrifice. We ruminate on it, we focus on it, we allow ourselves to be defined by it and named by it, and instead of focusing on God's deliverance, we focus on our failure. Don't we all do that? I mean, we look in the mirror and the first thing we we focus on is not God's goodness. No, we focus on how far we've fallen short. Do you want to know what's happening across this country on Father's Day? There's a lot of dads who look at themselves in the mirror and go, I did not fulfill my role. And they're swept with shame. And they've completely forgotten they have a heavenly father that said, you can start today. Call your kids. Step up. Don't curate the failure. Start new today. And it's not just for dads, it's for people all over the place. Because we all have a memory, boy, that we just, we just can play that old tape so quickly, can't we? I'm going to tell you something. That memorial to your past or your failure, it needs to be torn down and the stones need to be scattered at the foot of the cross. So we're going to get ready now. We're going to turn a corner because we started it at the end. There was an appropriate time to scatter or to gather stones. We took hold of, we just gave you four reasons for that. There's also a time to scatter stones. So if you gathered them up to make an altar to your failure, there's a time when you need to release the old memories and let them go. It's time for some of us to stop coming back to that memorial that we created to our own failure and we come back to it over and over and over again. There's a moment when you need to stop doing that, tear down that memorial and go in a completely different direction. Isaiah 43 says this. It says, if you keep coming back to the memory of your old failure, you're actually being disobedient to Scripture because here's God's perspective. Isaiah 43 says, 
Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, and then he's God talking, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. This is a word that the people of Christ the King need to hear. It's time for you to kick down that old altar of your broken memories and scatter those stones. You are not defined by who you were or what you did in the past. You are who God says you are right in this moment. So stop holding on to the old stones. Release them. In fact, start throwing them out in the opposite direction that they came to you. Scatter the old stones. Jesus gave himself and paid the price so you could be set free from those old memories. 11.15, yes? Yes. You know, I remember the first time I heard the lyrics to, to this old song, and I remember what happened inside of me. You see, I had been curating old piles of failures, moments where I just didn't measure up. And I remember hearing these. Can you just let these words wash over your soul if right now you're going back in your memory to a failure? Can you hear me brokenhearted and all you prisoners of your past? Come and find your freedom at last. There is mercy for the memories that holds you in your pain. So come and stand in the cleansing of forgiving rain. For as far as the eastern sky is to the west, and as deep as the ocean's deepest depths, your sin has been carried away by a God who forgives and forgets. So come find mercy for the memories. There is mercy for the memories. Come find mercy for the memories and rest. It's time to scatter the old stones. And I have the perfect place for you to put them. There are moments when I flip open my Bible, and I've been studying my Bible for a really, really, really long time. There are moments when I flip it open, and, and I love it when, when this hits me. I go, I have never seen that before. I have no idea where that came from. I found one of those this past week when I was studying this idea of scattering stones and gathering stones. And it just popped out of, it just popped out of a commentary, 2 Kings chapter 3. But here's what you need to know as a backstory. When the Israelites would conquer a land, they would often scatter stones on the fields of their enemy in order to, to render the fields impossible to either plant or harvest. Now, I want to remind you, the only time that the Israelites ever conquered a country or conquered a group of people is because those people were doing evil, okay? They didn't just arbitrarily show up and go, we're going to take over this country, or God told us to take over this group of people. That was not the way that it worked. It was because of evil embedded within a society, and God's people showed up to say, oh, no, you don't. And then to show that they had conquered that land, they would drop stones in the fields of this other group of people in order to make their fields impossible or difficult to plant or harvest. 2 Kings 3.25 says this, they destroyed the towns and each man threw a stone on every good field until it was covered. Okay, I am not telling you to do this with your neighbor, Okay. Don't just start throwing rocks over top of a fence. That's not what I'm asking you to do, but I am asking you to do this, okay? The people of Israel, as a sign of victory, would drop a rock in the field of their enemy. I want you to do exactly the same thing. Here's the practical application of Solomon's teaching. I'm gonna ask us all to make this statement. I'm gonna drop a rock in the devil's field this week. I want you to think this way. I want to challenge you to drop a rock of kindness right in the middle of the devil's field by being kind to someone with no expectation of anything in return. I just want you to randomly do something kind for somebody who's not expecting anything and just see whether or not it actually provokes some kind of a response. I want you to drop a rock of laughter in a world of whining and complaining. Has anyone else noticed what human beings have become really, really good at? We whine and we complain. It's endless fits of whining and complaining. I'm asking you to drop a rock of laughter in the middle of it. If you need to use a dad joke, go for it. Just make somebody smile. Drop a rock of compassion 
In the life of someone who's hurting, drop a rock of patience in a world of hurry. Drop a rock of humility and just serve somebody. Drop a rock of contentment and thank God for what you have. Has anyone else noticed how some of our best fits of whining and complaining are about things that we don't think we have? Can I remind you of something? If you're sitting in this room today, you're in the 96th percentile of the richest people on the face of the planet. I don't feel rich. You're rich. The question is always in comparison to who? Well, it's just like, well, Grant, I'm not rich. I only have an iPhone 11. <laughs> Drop a rock of contentment and thank God for what you have. Drop a rock of gratitude and thank Jesus for salvation. If you had a dad who was there, thank God that he actually was there for you. If you didn't have a dad, thank you. Thank God that you have a heavenly father who can fill all the holes that the human left behind. Thank your boss for their leadership. Thank a community servant for loving your town or your county. Drop a rock and smile at somebody. If you were here last week and heard Pastor Steve Osborne preach about the pancakes and theology, that was just fantastic. Drop a rock of joy and just smile at someone else. Because if the people of God don't have a reason to be joyful, no one does. Drop a rock of wisdom. Pray before you speak. Drop a rock of self-control and choose Jesus instead of that earthly desire. Drop a rock in the field of your enemy for the glory of Jesus. I'm going to do this this week, and I want to encourage you to do exactly the same thing with me. I'm going to start scattering stones, stones of hope and joy and peace. I'm going to drop rocks of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control right in the middle of the enemy's field. I want you to know why we're going to do this, because when we pile up those rocks... What the enemy wants to sow can't grow. Do we understand that? Can I tell you what the enemy is sowing in our community right now? Discord, hatred, and greed. But here's what will happen if we drop enough rocks. If we drop enough rocks in his field, we're going to erect an altar of God's passion for people right in the face of the enemy, and we're going to remind him of this truth. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And then furthermore, I'm going to invite you into another scattering. This is actually going to happen in the next couple of minutes. There's a holy moment when the people of God come and gather together. It's beautiful. Don't ever underestimate the power of gathering together. But there's also a moment at the end of the service when the people of God are scattered out across the community and they take the message of Jesus with them. So listen to the words of 1 Peter chapter 2. The Bible says, As you come to Jesus, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to Him, you also like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe the stone is precious, but to those who do not believe the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is what they were also destined for. Jesus says, I have an invitation for you. As the holy stones, the living stones of God's family spread out across the community, We need to keep putting the chief cornerstone that saved us in front of people so that they trip over it, so that they fall forward into the arms of a God who says, I will cover all of your sin with my sacrifice. Boy, we all have a lot of work to do. You know, the reality is some of you that are here today and some of you that are watching online, you need to accept 
today the sacrifice of Jesus and receive him as your personal Lord and Savior, to choose him as your personal cornerstone to build your life on. Some of you need to begin the process today of actually building your life on the solid rock of Jesus. The good news is this, that rock does not move. Some of you need to tear down that old altar of your failure that you keep revisiting over and over again and you need to replace it with an altar where every day you lay down your life before God and say, God, use me for your purpose. Some of you need to drop a rock in the field of your spiritual enemy. Time to stop being passive and start building a different kind of altar. And all of us must accept our role and our identity because God has called us living stones who are being built into a spiritual dwelling place that has a cornerstone and that cornerstone, the chief cornerstone, is Jesus. So I had the privilege this past week of sitting with some of my recovery heroes. Christ the King is filled with people who have walked a difficult and often rocky path towards Jesus. And I love being able to to sit and celebrate with some of them when they are celebrating a new kind of sobriety, when they're celebrating a new kind of life being clean and sober, and Jesus is the reason for all of it. And I just absolutely love to hear their stories of how Jesus saved them from the depth of addiction. It was interesting, as I was sitting in this little circle, they, they were talking about their old lives, and many of them actually um, reached into their wallet and pulled out an old mug shot. It showed a picture of someone who was defined by a different set of decisions. You know what struck me? Is how different they look now. There was an emptiness, and now there's a fullness. One statement in that little circle was, was made that just stuck out to me. It was a young man. I've had the privilege of just kind of watching his journey over the last number of years. And, and he said this. He goes, Grant, I hit rock bottom. I had no idea that the rock at the bottom was Jesus. I hit rock bottom. I had no idea that the rock at the bottom was Jesus. Whatever spiritual work God has for you today, whether it's to gather some stones or to scatter them, my prayer is that we will be faithful in executing everything that God has for us. My prayer is that the wisdom of Solomon from all of those centuries ago would resonate in our heart and that we wouldn't just hear the word, but that we would be, we would be doers of the word and, and, and move in the direction God wants us to move today. Some of us need to gather. Some of us need to scatter. Some of us need to do both. May we be faithful in doing exactly that. Would you pray with me this morning? Father God, I thank you for an opportunity Thank you for an opportunity to hear your wisdom and your word one more time again today. God, on this Father's Day weekend, we thank you that you are everything we need as a heavenly father. God, I pray for those who grew up in homes where dad was a stable presence, and I pray that they would be filled with gratitude for him today. Lord, for those who had a dad who fell short, I pray in the name of Jesus that they would come to their heavenly father And that they would hear his words as he says, forgive as the Lord forgave you. God, may we do that deep work on this important weekend. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters, those who need to do spiritual work with gathering stones and those who need to do the spiritual work of scattering them. Lord, as we walk out of here today with more word tied into our hearts, I pray that we would be both faithful and active. So God, I thank you that we can move towards you in these moments. Lord, for those who are being shamed by the enemy right now because of an old memorial that they created out of a failure, God, I pray that they would take those stones, walk out into the enemy's field and drop them in acts of kindness, 
compassion, service, and hope this week. God, would you do that good work in our hearts and we will give you all of the praise and all of the glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So whatever it is that God is asking you to do this weekend, now's the time. Now is the time. For those of you that are in the room, I'm going to ask you to stand with me because we're not done yet. We're going to worship together. Those of you that are home, I'm going to invite you to change your posture somehow so that we can walk into this moment together and worship the God who has made all of this possible. Let's worship together. God bless you.